Welcome to Chew the Fat. I'm Russell Alford. And I'm Patrick Hanlon. And this is a new podcast from the two of us who some of you may be more familiar with as the Gastrogays. In this series, we're going to talk to and chat with some of our favourite people and share their stories, their talents and their tales with you in weekly episodes or just to listen at your leisure. Thank you so much for downloading this particular episode, which is all about somewhere very familiar to us. It's our home region of the Boyne Valley. Well, kind of. I grew up in the town of Drogheda. Meanwhile, I grew up a little bit further down the road in Balbriggan County, Dublin. But after five years of living in London, we're now back at the heart of the Boyne Valley, one of the hottest food destinations in all of Ireland right now. But why is it so notable? Well, a lot of it is down to the incredible producers around here. There are so many talented and enterprising people, families and businesses who are creating some of the best food and drink in Ireland right now. Let's begin at our first stop, which is Drummond House in Baltray, which is about 10 minutes outside of Drogheda Town. It's here where Marita Collier begins by, well, feeding us her increasingly popular garlic scapes. Oh, Whoa. garlic scapes. Pungent. Kicked. Yeah, yeah. and it's a slow one. It's about four or five yeah. seconds. Oh, that is delicious. That's intense. But when you really cook gorgeous. that it dramatically now, goes really sweet and mild that right. what you've had there now and then you're going sitting down on your first time you've cooked them and then you go oh it's completely right. different so you have the option of i don't really want that heat mm. i'll cook them mm. i do really want the heat i'll actually put them on top of the pizza at the yeah, end the Asian stir fry. Yeah, but see they're huge in asia yeah huge they yeah. all they know about scapes mm. and the, the nice part about it is there is only one per plant yeah so once that's picked not so once we've the field cleared that's it till next year so if they sell out all this week that's it that's it if it takes two weeks that's it it's, it's gone it's gone oh that's delicious but the girls were out picking that this morning because oh, wow. there's no machine in the world that'll pick scapes yeah it's so it has to be done by hand and if you don't you see it'll reduce my bulb by 25 percent. so yeah. i'm actually growing garlic and you yeah. can't grow scapes without growing garlic so that's that lovely you know, uniqueness of kind of going, oh, well, you know, Patrick and Russell are going to say, we'll grow fields of scapes. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck <laughs> with that. Yeah. To grow garlic first, you yeah. know? Yeah. So a typical day starts before sunrise? A typical day would, in this weather now, because you make hay, the old-fashioned saying has really kicked in, because when the weather turns against you, it can be miserable. The field gets mucky. So it's lovely and bone drying out the minute. So, you know, you're awake, so you might as well get up at half five and start picking. And the orders are coming in, so they have to be carried in. They're all washed down so that they're completely clean of dust and everything. Then you're doing one kilos. So like this morning, I had to have 30 kilos up. The lovely Mikal in the greenhouse rings me yesterday. I'm out of the scapes and he only got them on Thursday. And do you know what? He was great. He contacted me about four years ago himself. Even though I wasn't dealing with LaRousse, yeah. he contacted me directly and he's really passionate about his stuff. And, but he tells me the length he wants them, the way he wants them. And now that I know him, I know his, his kind of the way he likes stuff. Yeah, it's great to meet the chefs because then they're the guys who've put me on their menus, yeah. people promoting it. So then people kind of start going into the multiples going, we want to buy so it gave me i was never going into retail ever i was scared of the multiples as well you hear all these stories of farmers and producers and your back goes against the wall and they make you go under with their demands and it really frightened me you know and i was going no if i'm doing this it's my business and we're doing it our way and i want to be top tier so like this is year five Five year overnight success, Incredible. isn't it? Oh, yeah. You're telling us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're telling us That's ours is also five years yeah. now. And like only in the last year, it's our actual job, it's our actual earning. So, you know, ours is, is also a long, long overnight yeah. Success. Long, 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 long. <laughs> but uh, you kind of you started in around the same time we went to London. Yeah. Then, yeah. if that's the case, in what 2013? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So life before that. Life before that, I was the stay-at-home mum. But before that, I was always in sales and marketing in the building mm. industry. So I've sold concrete pipes mm. and roof tiles and Stanley cookers. I love selling and I love people. And mm. I think that's the part that's easy for me. So had two babies and then decided 
they're going to start primary school now. I'd like to do something, but I still want to do the school gates. I want to see the little faces coming out going, oh, you had a bad day. Get over here, talk to me. That connectivity with your family. And I was an older mum as well. So, but I found, like I was 37 having my first baby, 40, the second one. So by the age of 43, 44, and I said, maybe I'll go back to work. Sure, I couldn't do Excel or PowerPoint or I could book a flight and shop online. The important thing. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Google, Chef Google. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I was like, oh my God, I'm so out of date, like, and to upskill. And it did intimidate me, I'll be honest, of kind of going, God, all these young bucks coming up now, they're, they're you know, they're, I didn't even have an iPhone at the time, like, and I was going, oh my God. It's, 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 it was really disheartening and it scared me and I didn't have the confidence. Mm. So I said to my husband, look, we have the farm here. And I thought, I like food and I like growing. So maybe I'll just do something. And we were on our trip in India, up the Himalayas. Mm. And that was a bucket list. It, it's definitely an experience. And uh, we saw garlic genuinely growing at 18,000 feet. And I was just like, oh great, we'll see how many people in Ireland are doing that. We'll ask them how to grow garlic. And you come back and there's nobody on a commercial scale at all. At all? No. Astonishing considering it is a key ingredient in virtually everything that an Irish person cooks day to day. Yeah. And then you check the place of origin of the garlic in all of the supermarket shelves. The Himalayas. China, <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. Asia, yeah. it's... You will get Spanish, you will get some French, but what's happened, unfortunately, a bit in France at the moment as well, is that anything over an acre is considered commercial. Mm. So you have a lot of small growers, really good growers in France. They have beautiful garlic and uh, in Spain. So we'll say in an area like Lotterec, which is a, a garlic, you could have 50 growers with mm. her half an acre, 1.1 acre, 1.5 acres, and they all bring their garlic collectively together to have volume. We didn't realise any of that and had no knowledge. And, you know, we contacted a couple of government bodies like Board B have no information on their food mm. library on garlic. It's not a category even. Wow. So we didn't fit in with the Department of Agri. We didn't yeah. fit in with Board B. And I actually really, and I was Googling, and I was saying, something wrong with Google. There's nobody in Ireland coming up with growing garlic. Mm. So it was, it was a really an eye-opener, and I was going... God, if there's nobody doing it, then this is, there's a reason. Yeah. There's a reason. It's hugely labor intensive. Hand planting, hand harvesting, hand weeding. We'd no tractor. We'd no irrigation system. We didn't realize it needed watering. So we lost the crop in the first year. 90% of it, the orange skip that's out there. And I had to pay to get it taken away. Oh, even worse. 32,000 euros worth of seed gone into the skip. It's been a learning curve um, because we didn't know. Mm. It'd be like you two deciding, right, we grow garlic. We were lucky. We met three nice farmers throughout Europe who we bought seed from, our heritage seed and our elephant seed from. And they very kindly gave us their knowledge, but their climates were different. Mm. So you're very much going with what you have here yeah. versus the Czech Republic or Poland for instance because their winters would be dramatically different to, to ours mm. their summers would be hotter um, it, it built us up each year you kind of go at the end of a year a bit deflated you definitely are you've made no money and you're going right okay but this time next year I know what I won't be doing yes <laughs> so how did you know in those early years that you know issue after issue how had you the inkling that you were on to something because it just tasted amazing even after year one that 10 percent, that little bit of seed we managed to keep and i was going if we did everything really wrong and it tastes this good imagine if we just got a 50 percent right next year you know it's a niche i have to scratch it you know it, it's, it's like i suppose like being at the races you know going maybe I'll just back another horse right because I have a feeling this time I know I'm going to win I just know I'm feeling lucky I'm feeling lucky and you back that horse and you're going I came in third but I know I can come in for it I know the next I'll just do once more yeah. I'll just and that's what it became like like it became uh, an addiction on perfecting planting perfecting clove popping you can see the scapes see their lovely little heads uh, they're, they're bobbing away 60,000 elephant bulbs in this field. 
which would mean there's 60,000 scapes because obviously one scape per bulb. Mm. Every day that has to be walked regardless because you're going, you're not ready, you're not, oh, you're ready, not ready, not ready. So we're going to be planting now, please, fingers crossed, by September. It's full on seven days a week mm. now for us mm. from here on in. It's every day out because they have to still be harvested Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. They don't take a break for the weekend. Rude. They won't let me go on holidays. How rude. It's really, you know, I definitely picked the, the hardest crop that comes into season. You know, mm. June, July, August. It's the good times. And then you have to plant in September. So we will home save seed from this. So what goes back into the ground has come out of here. Mm. My husband, when you're on your hands and knees for a long time in a mucky field, you'll think very, very quickly. And he's really tacky. I wouldn't be any good at that now. Uh, designed a garlic planting machine from scratch and got it made. Wow. Yeah. H- handy uh, use of skills. Oh, yeah. I tell you. Because you couldn't physically go out because we were physically clove by clove by mm. clove. And then obviously my footsteps are smaller than his. So each drill had different quantities. Mm. Whereas you think, so this is precision planting now. There's exactly the same amount of cloves per bed. So that we then will know when we, we're going to double this for next year. So we'll go into the next section of field and that we will know we've 30 beds here we'll do 60 next year so if there's 60 here now we'll have 120,000 which means I'll have 120,000 scapes everyone in Ireland will now be eating scapes for every meal absolutely (laughs) but then it means that that flavour that ingredient is on more restaurants across the country and the chefs can get more excited about being able to use it during that season as well absolutely and that's that's the whole nice thing about it people are eventually now this is year five so we're launching our lovely like retail packet with mm. it but what we're doing is we're we're putting on our nice grill me or saute me or roast me mm. barbecue me to help people grasp it mm. and then kind of go do you know what i'll buy one packet and i'll try it yeah And I think once they do, then they'll go, do you know what, actually, I'll buy that again. And then they'll go, ah, feck, the season's over. Exactly. As you say, if you're given little instructions, such as, you've never seen this before, try it. But here's how you use it. It's really good. I suppose it avoids any elitism of, you know, oh, I know what a garlic scape is, you don't. And people do, in (laughs) fairness, want to try. And it's a very simple thing to just kind of go, you know, here's how to eat me. Mm. And, you know, people go, well, actually, I will give that a try. Mm. And then they've seen it on menus. They'll see little articles about it and they'll go, I think I read about that. Yeah. Was that that thing? Yeah. And little by little, and we do it with the term of feckin' school. Mm. We do it with some of the local schools come September. We give them up cloves. So the younger classes get to plant mm. in their gardening beds. So now the garlic is kicking in down in term of feckin' school and the kids have to take turns at watering and measuring the scapes. And they know what scapes are now. Mm. Fourth class, third class, and they're they're watching their garlic. Mm. And they get to bring it home, and they've grown it for nine months because yeah. it goes in in September and goes through their cycle with them. Perfect. I think that's a great fun thing mm. to do. Mm. And exactly like you said, in the area here for the Boyne Valley and in such a small radius, mm. the amount of excellent top-tier producers and artists and producers who actually care. Do you know what I mean? You you definitely will never make your fortune out of it because when you're lying in bed at four in the morning and five going, oh God, should I have done it that way? You definitely don't get paid for that. No. <laughs> you definitely no, don't. No one pays you for self-consultancy, no. No. <laughs> no, and you don't put a value of your hour mm. of time and you know, you, you'll think of something, you'll go back to something else. But I think definitely Lao, the Meath and the whole ancient East around here, the amount of foodie, mm. top tier, it, it just blows every week when I yeah. see somebody new, I'm yeah. going this is fantastic mm. and with that we hit the road again and no more than five minutes away is Bally McKenney Farm in the Bally McKenney area just outside of Drogheda. We sat down with Maria Flynn in her kitchen over a cup of tea and she tells us a little bit more about how she and her husband David started growing unusual varieties of potato and other vegetables which are some of the most sought after ingredients of the best chefs in the area and beyond. I had a career in finance and uh, David worked for his dad on the farm. Everything was fine then his dad retired and I was pregnant with Daniel. So I gave up my job 
no problem. Had no problem giving up my career. I was in my 30s, having my first baby, married. Everything was fitting into place, so it was fine. My plan was I do the accounts, the book work, the paperwork. Farming has become more and more labour intensive with paperwork, even as opposed to the generation before us. So that was going to be my gig on the farm. And David took over the farm 2007. And I think the first couple of seasons were pretty much okay. So what we would have done is, it's a tillage farm. So we would have had, I don't know, maybe 70 to 100 acres of potatoes, mainly rooster. And then about 300, 350 acres of corn, commercial corn. And that's just what we did. That's what his father did. That's what we did. Pretty soon after we took over, not long at all. I don't talk in years, I talk in seasons now. Do you know what I mean? And about two seasons in, I could see problems. What happened with us is David just kept thinking, next season, this is going to be it. Next season, this is going to be it. And it wasn't. We were losing money every year and machinery was breaking down and maybe we couldn't afford to get it fixed or on time for harvesting and planting then your planting got delayed or your harvest got delayed it becomes a cycle almost of neglect you know and very disheartening i would i and i i have said it before it's not a secret and i don't think we should be ashamed of saying these things i'm quite a strong person but i found it was starting to affect me my mental health I w- I'm not being dramatic, but, you know, I was down a lot of the time and it wasn't a nice place to be. And I have a young son. I didn't want him affected by any of this. So I said to David, look, I need a happy place to go to with all of this going on, because we talked about me going back to work outside the farm. But to be honest with the, the jobs there and the money coming in, I was really doing that much work on the farm anyway. He would have had to brought somebody in and pay them for replacing me. So it just wasn't an option. So um, I needed a happy place. And I had a chat with a veg grower, actually. And he talked about growing for food service rather than for supermarkets. And it's not something I'd thought about. And our infrastructure is potatoes. We had no extra money to throw at a new idea. Mm -hmm. So I said, what can we do differently with potatoes? So I said, we'll grow some purple ones. I had eaten them in London. Oh. I don't know how many years ago. I knew they were about, but I'd never seen them actually in Ireland and never gone into a restaurant with them, on the menu even. So it was taking a risk, but I thought in my head, if I get into my car and go to the restaurants in Dublin, you know, the nicer ones, and just get guys, I have these, and maybe get a bit of cash in, mm-hmm. get the roots yeah. done, yeah. get the nails <laughs> done. Okay. And it would give me something positive to be thinking about. So David, with farming, they don't do things in small measures. David ordered half a tonne of Violetta seed for me. And he planted them with the queens we were planting that year. So I actually ended up with nine (laughs) tonne of purple potatoes. But we got through them. Um, I did a gig in the RDS for four days, which I, I, I said to David going up to the RDS on the first day, don't get disheartened. I'm doing this because there'll be some chefs there. But it was a public it wasn't a trade a trade show god the public loved them absolutely loved them david had the idea we put some in little bags two kilo bags just if we cleared enough money to pay for our tolls and our petrol there must be 100 tolls between here and the rds and uh, i think we bagged up about 70 bags and we sold out by three o'clock on the first day and we had 70 bags for four days so that was a huge boost and a couple of days after the whole thing finished, Odea's Foods rang me and the rep came down and said, we, love, we saw you up there. We love what you're doing. So that was exciting for me. Yeah. And I had a great season with them. We, we got there. We got through the nine tonne. Look, we were giving them away. We were throwing them at people. <laughs> we were doing everything we had to do. We sold some as well. But it really gave us a bit of a platform. Mm. And it was going a direction I never expected it to go. Then LaRousse Foods came along and they asked us to partner with them and we considered it for a while and we moved over to LaRousse. So many things have happened in such a short period of time that I never expected to happen. Um, It brought some extra income into the farm, which is always good. But more importantly, it gave David 
another direction to go in. We didn't know what to do. And unknowns to ourselves, we were creating another business. And people kept saying, this is brilliant, this is great. And I'm going, yeah, I think it is. And I, hadn't, I didn't realise it yeah. for a long time. And then I started thinking about it like a business. And I said, well, look, corporate potatoes aren't going to... We can't, you know, just have one thing, a one-trick pony. So I researched other varieties and colours. And I have three steadfast ones now, the Pink for Apple, the Red Emily and the Violetta. This year I'm adding a couple of newbies into the mix and see how they go. So Yukon Gold is one of those, which is a big hit in America. Yeah. It's just potatoes that aren't grown hugely here. Mm. Prob probably not anywhere, commercially anyway. I don't need to sell tons and tons and tons. And I choose to keep my potatoes seasonal. Yeah. You will get them until the end of April and then that's it. There's a couple of issues. The main one for me is the longer potatoes are in cold storage, they deteriorate. And the other thing is, there's menu fatigue. I want the chefs to be looking forward to them. When venison season starts again, I want them to be looking forward to having them again. Mm -hmm. So that's the two key, key reasons why we keep them seasonal. So I said, right, I need an income in the summer. <laughs> what do we do now? And uh, I went to Fruit Logistica last February, 12 months, and saw some lovely ideas for veg. Mm -hmm. Hybrids. Mm -hmm. So common enough veg but with a little twist and that's what I wanted to to do didn't know if they could grow here I didn't but you, you don't know till you try so you just do it so the first thing we did and it was a great success and we're doing it again this year we're the frivoli so it's a hybrid between a kale and a purple brussels sprout so it's like a little brussels sprout flowering out but because of the kale in it you can roast them and they're incredibly tasty I needed a good seller Tender stem broccoli is just that. I don't have the uh, trademark, I'm not trademarked to grow tender stem broccoli. So we have a variety called, it's long stem broccoli, it's called Kai Brock. We're growing that because I think it's popular. I needed a good, strong, steady seller. So I'm hoping that I've got 80,000 seeds being propagated and we're successional planting two, uh, 4,000 plants every two and a half weeks. And this is totally new for David and I. It's a massive undertaking. Mm -hmm. So far, so good. We'll go to the field a little later and I'll show those to you. But what I've thrown into the mix there is um, a hybrid of a cauliflower. So if you think cauliflower and think tender stem broccoli, the cauliflower is going to be a long stem with little florets of cauliflower. Do you understand what oh, I'm trying to say? I've seen these before. Yeah, yeah. they mm. look beautiful. Yeah, so I'm excited. Yeah. Um, now, I've only got about 700 plants because I wasn't sure, but I've got a waiting list of chefs. And uh, the amazing thing is, David has completely tuned in to this business. For the first time in, I think, 40 or 45 years, there's no corn being grown on the farm this year. Wow. Yeah. Is it kind of a, a sad thing that there's no corn? Or is it just the evolution of everything that is just part of the course? It, look, it's bittersweet. Yeah. I think um, it's unfortunate and it's sad that the farm can no longer function in the way that it has done for generations. Mm. However, personally, I'm really happy because we were losing money. I think it's incredibly sad for family farms because I'm afraid we're going to lose them. Mm. David would, and I would be an atypical family farm. Some family farms have done brilliantly well and have got mega businesses and shout out to them absolutely hard work got them where they are but on the whole that doesn't happen for family farms and we are what we are we're going from generation to generation hoping <laughs> to make it through and you don't want to be the generation that it all falls apart on so I am not unhappy that the corn has stopped because it just had to I'm unhappy that David can't have the luxury, so to speak, of running the farm the way he's been trained to and what he's watched for, for years. You know, his way of farming is just not there anymore. So at nearly 50, he is having to rethink. So it's sad, but look, it's, look at the journey it's bringing us on. Yeah, well, it's been, you know, you were saying about earlier on about the awards and likes that, you know, <laughs> it wouldn't probably have happened had it not been for this kind of change in direction. Definitely wouldn't have happened. As farmers, the way we were farming, we were bottom of the chain. We got no respect from anybody. And this is, you know, farming in general. Um, 
But to have people appreciate, you don't have to get awards. When a chef puts up a picture of something I've grown on a plate and they're so proud to give the potato a name, give it an identity and call it Bala McKenney Farm as well. And the chefs are proud to do it. And I just, I, I, the hair stand up on my arms. You want to see me sometimes on a Saturday night because, you know, there's phone pings and photographs are coming up. And I'm just saying to David, this is incredible. So that was reward enough. But then to get these two awards, if we never get another one, we probably won't. It doesn't matter. I think the two we have are, we couldn't get much better. The most recent one is the Euro Talk Award. You know, it's prestigious. Mm. It's prestige right there. Um, I never thought we'd win one. I didn't think we were, um, the words good enough come to mind, but I don't mean that. I, people have been working in food for 40 years and 30 years and honing skills and still haven't got one of these awards. So you feel a little bit, oh my God, you know? And two of the people, Sally Barnes, 40 years she's been smoking fish and doing an incredible job. And there we were standing beside her. And the cheese lady and her son, she has built up a business from one goat, yeah. single parent, to now her son is making a living out of the business as well and supporting his family. Oh my God. And we popped up in 2015 and here we are. But I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for it. And I think it's no harm because I think it will encourage other farmers. Well, if, if they can do it, we can do it. You don't have to have a 40 year lineage to win a Eurotalk award. You can just do something that they think is making a difference. We then head out to the farm to take a walk around and see where the magic happens. Um, just whilst you are here, I'll show you very quickly. Um, wow. David set up a shed for me. Yeah. So basically what we have here is a grading shed and we have three fridges that in total hold um, four, four and a thousand ton of potatoes. So just to put it in perspective, not that anyone listening will know what I'm talking about, but that's a ton box. So one of those full is a ton of potatoes. So we have enough fridge storage to hold a thousand of those boxes. So that's the scale of farming we're coming from, back down to small, 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 yeah. David gave me um, we had an ambient store and David set it up for me when I started my purple potato journey. Mm -hmm. And that's just what I'm going to show you now. But he's lovely. Look, he's put up little signs for me. So this is your little, yeah. this is your science lab. This is my kingdom. This is a calmer place. Yes. Much calmer and quieter. What we do in here is when we harvest the vegetables or the potato, well, they're all vegetables, but whatever we're harvesting, I will be boxing them in here into, we've, we've our little signature white box mm. with our label on it. So I make the boxes, I stick the labels on the boxes and I take the produce out of the, the bins, so to speak, and everything that goes into the boxes, either David or I oversee it. Mm. So it's like a such hand inspected before it goes into the box. Yeah, because they are paying a premium price for yeah. it. So they expect a premium product you know, so you have to stand by it. We get a great, great joy when you're stacking your pallet up with boxes for Larousse because chefs have ordered it. It's an incredible feeling, yeah. you know. So for Valentine's Day last year, <laughs> David did the, <laughs> all my little newspaper cuttings oh. and put them in a frame oh, for me. Sweet. What yeah. there? There's... One clipping in particular caught our eyes celebrating women in agriculture and we asked Maria to explain a little bit more about it. At the beginning of the year, a chef rang me and told me that they had nominated me for an award that they saw in the Irish Farmers Journal. And I said, well, that's really nice. Thanks very much. And they said, um, well, you've got through to the judges' visits and they're coming to visit you tomorrow. Oh, God. No pressure. No <laughs> well, pressure. I didn't feel much pressure, but David, on the other hand... He felt pressure. He was sweeping and sweeping. <laughs> but um, they came, two ladies came, and I didn't know anything about the award, genuinely, and that's been very true. And I had to Google it that night, and it was an award put together by Country Living Magazine and the Irish Farmers Journal and FBD Insurance. So the girls came, two, two judges came. We did a three-hour interview, I suppose, for the one. It was a chat. They wanted to know the story from start to finish and I told it quite um, truthfully, warts and all, and uh, they left. And about two weeks later, we got a phone call to say that we were in the final four 
and we actually so there was four of us at the Clifford Lines we got brought to the Clifford Lines oh, <laughs> I know delicious. Asher Castle Clifford Lines you know and we had a lovely meal there and they announced the winners so there was two of us for my section and two for the other section so I won my category which was for um, innovation on farm and it's a women in agriculture award which is amazing so um, the IFA were represented there and I was able to say, and I, I felt really good about that, I was able to say, I was really, really honoured to receive the award, but it shows the sad state of Irish family farming in Ireland at the moment, that women are actually in their droves coming out and doing these things to keep family farms alive. So, you know, it's great, but what has gone wrong? What has gone wrong? And are we going to allow it to continue? Do you know what I mean? So. Uh, we had a fantastic day and the great part about that award is it has a European counterpart. So through the IFA, I am now representing Ireland in Europe amazing. for women in agriculture. Wow. Excellent. Mm. Amazing chance to shine a light. Yeah. For potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> Irish potatoes, women, it's amazing. I know that, Absolutely amazing. that they've chosen us Credit to, to represent. You. So, what is it, 26, 27 countries in the, in the EU now? Decreasing. Yes. 26, 27 <laughs> countries. So, we will be the Irish representative in Brussels. No better. We hope you're enjoying listening to Chew the Fat and we want to take a second to say a big thank you for tuning in. We're set to talk to Blonnet from La Stoke Distillery next, which you won't want to miss. But if you're enjoying listening to this and want to pledge your support for our podcast and future podcasts just like it, we'd love you to visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash gastrogaze, where you can join the community over there and check out some of our rewards, including exclusive access to upcoming episodes and personalised content from us directly to you. Your support helps keep this podcast going and we have so many more exciting, interesting and engaging episodes to come. And via Patreon, you'll be the first to hear when a new episode is available. Okay, now that we stopped begging you for money, we travelled out to Tenura to visit the brand new location of the Stoke Distillery, which is Ireland's first gin school and the producer of an absolutely fabulous local gin. Hello, I'm Blonid from Le Stoke Distillery and Gin School. Um, we are a craft distillery here in the heart of the Boyne Valley in County Louth. We make a really special craft gin called... Stoke 1777. Okay, I'll take over here. Yeah. Oh, the smell. Smell oh, heaven. The I know. Yeah. It's gorgeous. Do you know what you should do? Stick your head in there. Stick your head in there. <laughs> Our favourite thing to do. Oh dear. Up to here? Yeah, now that's the batch that we made last night. Oh my god, that smells incredible. That's like my dream. A how many litres is that? There are 16,000 litres came off that. 16,000 litres of no, gin. 1,600. 1,600 litres of gin, yeah. I, I won't take it then That's if it's only that. Thousand in the difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We launched Le Stoke in October 2016. Um, we launched it at Whiskey Live um, and it was immediately picked up by Dublin Airport, the, buyer, the head buyer from um, Dublin Airport. And the airport wanted it exclusively until February 2017. So the product is really on only on the market on general re release since about February 2017. So it's not that um, old. We grew much quicker than we ever anticipated. Um, we never anticipated in two years being out of the original building in the Stoke and having to move into a 6,000 square foot building. So it all happened really, really, really fast. But we now, this, this still here, we haven't named it yet, but still they're always named after ladies. When mm. you guys do gin school, you'll come and learn that. Um, but we haven't named this one yet. We haven't quite decided, but this is a 2000 liter still. Um, and it is now the biggest gin still in Ireland. What? So someone here last, uh, last week asked me um, if, if it's 2000 liter still and you're um, the biggest producer of gin in Ireland, does that not mean you've taken the craft out of it? Um, my answer to that was, well, we're still only producing in the hundreds of litres. We're not producing in the thousands of litres like they would be in the UK and, you know, the bigger brands would. Mm. We're very, very, still very much in our infancy. That will be for our main production, for the main product, Le Stoke 1777. And then 
on the way, there's another 500 litres still. It'll go in here. So that's Judy. She's a 50 litre still. So small. Tiny. Yeah. It looks like, it, it looks like um, a, a bucket that you'd have in the garden it for really some potting plants. It's so small <laughs> with a couple of contraptions coming yeah. out of it. So um, that's, it's, she's very special to us. She was commissioned on the 1st of April 2016 and mm. that's where we developed our recipe. So that's where we perfected the Le Stoke recipe. So she's very special to us. So currently now we use her for kind of product development for small runs for hotels or um, restaurants that want their own gin. Mm. So that's where it starts. And then the next still, it's on the way. It's in, being delivered as we speak, it will be a 500 litre still. Um, and that will be for kind of medium sized runs. So hotels that have their own brand that are upping their production. Mm. And then this will be for our core products. That will be for the Stoke 1777, and we also have a new gin coming out, um, cacao and raspberry. Mm. We uh, the gin we make is a London Dry style, um, which is most tightly regulated and governed by the EU. So it's really strictly controlled. We don't put anything artificial into our gin. All the flavour comes from the botanicals that go directly into the pot. Mm. Nothing post distillation. So that's why we think it's such a good quality and flavoursome product. Um, so why gin? Why did you get into gin? How did the journey begin? How did the gin journey, journey gin. begin for you? Um, well, Brona, our managing director, she had opened two previous distilleries, potching distilleries, um, and for different reasons they didn't work out. So three years ago, James and I had just moved back from New York and we were shopping around for business and we ran into Brona and she had seen the business model in the UK She'd seen the distillery and the gin school attached and the brand and the gin school attached and she put it to us, what would you think of this? So myself and myself went over to the model she was talking about and had a look at it and we said, yeah, that w we could do that and we could actually do a better version of it. We decided to go for it then, so then we needed a location. So we knew that there was a building available in Stoke House and Garden, so we approached them about it and they went for it. So that's how the brand kind of came to be. Um, all the botanicals that go into the recipe or all the botanical, all those botanicals are found on the townland of the Stoke. Mm. So that's where we got the inspiration for the recipe from. So then after that, we got too many col um, copper stills uh, and I had one at my kitchen sink for about six months. Brona had one at her kitchen sink for about six months. Yeah. Both she homemade. Yeah. yeah. She wanted, um, Brona really wanted elderflower at the time. Remember elderflower was really trendy. She wanted elderflower and I wanted honeysuckle. Um, but we couldn't agree on either so we ended up with jasmine. Perfect. Nice, yeah. nice middle ground. Exactly, yeah. So um, we started producing then in July 2016 as I said and then we went to market in October 2016. Yeah, so we, we outgrew the building in Lestoke very, very quickly. Um, much, much quicker than we anticipated. Um, and we started kind of running into difficulties. You know, it was an old building with health and safety mm -hmm. and for production and stuff. It just, we couldn't continue. So we had to outsource. But it was very important to us that we remained in County Louth, mm -hmm. kept it local, uh, you know, kept it as authentic as possible. So we're here in Tenure in Monaster Boyce. Um, and this building has been custom designed. I know it doesn't really look like it right now, but it has been custom designed for gin production. Mm. So we needed to move the gin school for licensing reasons. So we decided, why not put a house inside a house? Mm -hmm. So that is why it's now Lestoke Gin House, um, and it houses Lestoke Gin School. So we've bigger capacity. So the other challenge we had in Lestoke was we weren't able to bring in coaches and tours, and it's been hugely popular and hugely, the gin school has been hugely successful. So, but at least now we can bring in coaches and we can bring in tours and bigger groups and hens and um, the intention is to get that working seven days a week. Yeah, so, you know, to uh, have a fully functioning tourist offering yeah. in, the, in the locality. So in the new gen school we have 18. Um, in the last one we had 12 um, because that was literally all we could fit. But because this unit was purpose built, we decided to go with 18. Because 18, when you do actually come to gin school, it's really fun. You know, people come as strangers and they leave as friends and they get taxis and to drop it or to whatever restaurants they're, they're going to together. It's fun and it's intimate, you know, without being impersonal. So everybody still gets one-on-one -on -one kind of 
information and education. We had to turn away a lot of business in the previous building because it was just too small. We lo logistically couldn't even get coaches up the lane. We have loads of room for loads of coaches. Amazing. Every coach. Every coach. Yeah. Bring them all. Them Send them all yeah. here. And they're all coming here because yeah. of the, the round tower. You know, there's, ton there's at least, I'd say, seven or eight buses go to the round tower every day. Wow. So we're hoping to kind of piggyback off that as well. And you wouldn't realise it either because, you know, it's a curse in a way of the motorways as they go exactly. past. You, yeah. Once they go bypass a place, people don't come along to it. Yeah. But as long as there's a good offering within the area, people will stick around for longer and dwell, I suppose, for a exactly. bit longer too. Yeah. And who is the audience of this school? Is it Irish? Is it international tourists? It's very much a mix. Um, when we launched the Gin School last February, um, it kind of went viral. So um, Italian Vogue picked it up the story, um, the National Geographic um, Traveller edition, they picked up the story. So it kind of got international attention. Um, American Airways actually tweeted about it, which was really weird. Um, so we've had people from everywhere. We've had, we've had groups of businessmen from Switzerland. Mm. We've had a family from uh, Oregon. We've had Germans, we've had Spanish, we've had people from everywhere. Um, mostly, mostly Irish and mostly um, the UK, surprisingly. Since we opened the Gen School, we have filled, I know it's only 12, but we're between about 12 and 24 extra beds in hotels in Drogheda, in Scholars and the D Hotel. Um, our customers are coming in from all over the country. They know they can't drive, so they book local hotels. A lot of times when they, they're, they're making their bookings with us, they'll get in touch with us, you know, for places to, that they recommend, local restaurants, you know, local attractions. So. Um, the, the gin school has been, you know, it's been great for the area, not just, not just us, but it's been really good for the area. It's brought people that would have never thought about coming to the east coast of Ireland, you know, to come and stay local and maybe visit Newgrange or Melfont Abbey, you know, especially people from the north and people from the west that they don't, why would they go east when everything there is so beautiful? But now they are coming east, you know, we've, we've brought them, we're dragging them here <laughs> to make gin, That's so... Best way to try yeah. anywhere, isn't it? Yeah, so they're uh, so yeah, it's been really and the locals have been really supportive as well. I think, you know, the locals are quite proud that we are the only gin school in the country. So um whenever they go anywhere they're talking about it, you know, they've they've come and they've been super supportive, thankfully, and when they go you know, when they're out and about they tell people, when they're on their holidays they tell people and we've gotten customers actually that way as well. We've had almost we've had about 1,800 visitors yeah. at this point, yeah. and I would say 90% of them stay in local hotels. That's wonderful. Yeah, really so there, there's, you know, 1,800 people that have never even been to Drogheda have come and they've stayed and they've eaten in local restaurants and they've had pints in local pubs. Ireland is awash with incredible food and drink producers, but we have a particular soft spot for our local area and its producers. And it's amazing to see and hear that food tourism is bringing so many people to our area. Yeah, it's great that people really want to see where food and drink comes from, understand how it's grown and really connect with these talented producers. But of course, the proof is in the eating and drinking. So as the Queen of Garlic, what is your favourite way to eat garlic? My favourite way is definitely whole roast to bulb. Oh. Cut off the roots at the bottom, put it sitting down, a couple of knobs of butter on the top of it, a bit of tin foil over it, into the oven so the butter melts into all your cloves. Uh, 50 minutes later, then take it out, lovely toasted sourdough bread, a bit of goat's cheese on it, and just spread that out on top of it, and maybe a bit of pesto and some crumbled walnuts or whatever. It's just to die for. A meal in itself. Oh, I'm salivating. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds incredible. <laughs> And deadly simple. Yeah. And you know, it, it's a meal, mm. deadly simple. And it is an ingredient that is a, it is, it's simple in its, in it's, its form, in its form, you know. I, I'm beating the drum the whole time. Garlic is food. It's yeah. not flavouring. Exactly. It's healthy. You know, it shouldn't, of course, add it to dishes, but you know, like garlic soup, garlic mm. and potato soup is delicious. Mm. Roasted garlic is delicious. Mm. I think, and because there's been so little variety and mm. choice maybe and quality in it that even myself, mm. that was, you know, I knew what I was comparing 
my disaster year one to mm. of I mean it looked even horrific I was like nobody'd even buy that <laughs> they'd actually do a GoFundMe program for me to, to, to feel that sorry for me do you know what I mean <laughs> like seriously God help her she's even tried to sell this she's lost the plot she's on her knees but the taste was magnificent that I'm going I can't go back to buying the imported stuff yeah. I just can't so I have to see what next year could yield mm. and that literally the, the heat in it and I get beautiful emails from people all around the country and I get beautifully you know thank you cards and you know one lady even did the novena for me there at length in Galway mm. and she emails me the whole time when is the garlic back in and she take you know people actually care yeah. and I was I was amazed mm. But when you make a fantastic product that is quintessentially Irish, it is for us, it's local, you have a connection to it. And, you know, more and more people are getting that connection to food again, thankfully, yeah. after I suppose the recession ruined it because people just wanted food that was cheap and affordable and quality really wasn't cared about. And it's just become this wave once again where everyone is thinking, right, where is it from? Is it local? Is it high quality? And is it a good price for what I'm getting? And, you know, I, I remember when we were sharing out about your garlic being for sale in Dunn stores, there's a couple of, you know, the snipe, oh, it's very expensive. It's like, well, you try growing it and being the only one in the yeah. country growing it. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's labour. Mm. It is labour. And up until that, hand harvesting, hand picking, mm. hand drying, those bags were, those bowls were broken by hand, one by one. Those bags were filled by hand, one by one. You know that you're kind of going... Well, yeah, I could import a load of fake Chinese stuff if I wanted. Be really smart, put my brand on. I'm going, no, because if I'm putting my name and it's leaving this farm, I know how it's leaving here and I know, no, I did that myself. No, you can't. Yes, there will be cloves occasionally damaged in it, mm -hmm. but they'll show up over time. They don't visually look like that when you're putting them in. Mm -hmm. But that proves how fresh it is. Exactly. You know, if it was still alive two years later, you're kind of going, what have they done with this garlic? Do you know what Won't I mean? Mind <laughs> yeah, I'd be glowing in the dark. <laughs> so. Who are the other producers in the area who you love? Michael Finnegan um, from Point Valley Blue Cheese. Mm. Amazing, amazing blue cheese. So we're big fans of that here as well. And then we've got good relationships with other alcohol producers in the area. So Dan Kelly. The Dan Kelly cider, we always recommend that if people want to move away from gin or the Boyne Brewhouse beers. Um, we love their beers. We also are big fans of Brew from Trim in County Mead. We love their products as well. So sometimes, not all, or not all the time, we do showcase other, you know, products from around the area and people are surprised and, you know, they haven't heard of it or they haven't heard of other beers, local beers or local food. So... We kind we kind of introduce, you know, other local offerings to to customers from around the country or from wherever they've come from. Um, but no, we've we, we've got a good we've got a really good relationship yeah. with every all the other Boyne Valley producers. So I think that's important to keep the, you know, the ship afloat. Yeah. It was so wonderful to hear Marita, Blonid, and Maria's stories, their successes and their struggles. Now it is worth mentioning that we actually didn't set out to have an all-female lineup in this episode. It just happened that these three inspiring, enterprising and talented ladies are the driving forces behind some of the most iconic food producer brands in the Boyne Valley. Thank you for listening to Chew the Fat. Be sure to subscribe and if you want exclusive access before anyone else, sign up to our Patreon at patreon.com slash gastrogaze. And you can find more of our content at gastrogaze.com as well as on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook where you can find us at, at gastrogaze. <laughs>